Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to another all-new edition of geek to me Radio. Today we are joined by science fiction author, comic co-creator, and trombonist, Chris Robertson, talking all about working on Hellboy at Dark Horse. We'll then be talking with Justin's comics owner, Justin Burnett, about the hottest trends in comic books. All that and more, stand by. And if you're driving around the greater St. Louis area right now, hearing this on 105.3 FM and 1380 AM, thank you very much for tuning in and listening. If you're hearing us out there in the world, as I know many of you stream us on the World Wide Web, thank you for finding us there. And of course, if you're hearing this after the fact in the podcast form on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Podomatic, we appreciate your finding us and subscribing and listening there each week. This segment brought to you by Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com is the website. Locations in 11 different states. Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. If you want to check out a movie, do it in first class. Do it at a Marcus Theaters. Just saw Alita Battle Angel at the beautiful renovated Marcus Ronnie's. And we saw it in IMAX. I'm telling you right now, that's the way to see a movie, especially one like this that was built for that kind of cinematic, just the surround sound, the IMAX viewing, it's fantastic. And if you've been to Ronnie's or any of the Marcus Theaters that have been newly renovated here in the St. Louis area, you know what I'm talking about. Out there in De Pere, they've got the Chesterfield they've done work on. It's absolutely fantastic. And maybe if you want to uh, look up their website, MarcusTheaters.com, you can also check out the concessions, the Five Star Lounge, the Bistro Plex, kind of get a sense of what you want to eat. Because nowadays, if you're going to go to a Marcus Theaters, it's kind of like you can get dinner and a movie all in one place. Have a drink beforehand if you want to get there a little early. It's a fantastic place just to hang out. And they've really done a great job of creating these as destination spots. Uh, It's not just date night. Let's go to the movies. Then we'll go to TGI Fridays. No, go to Marcus. Have your whole date night right there. Get drinks. Go in, sit in there, have them bring your food to you, enjoy the immersive surround sound, those big reclining heated seats. And if you're going to see Alita Battle Angel, if you're going to see any of the movies around, maybe you haven't seen Aquaman yet, do it at a Marcus Theater. Get your tickets now for Captain Marvel coming out here very soon. You can do it all right there. Get your tickets online. Find the one closest to you. MarcusTheaters.com is that website. I'm very excited to talk to our first guest. We've got Chris Robertson, uh, co-creator of iZombie, which is coming to its conclusion, the fifth and final season. He also is a sci-fi writer, very prolific. He's currently co-writing Hellboy in the BPRD 1956 alongside Hellboy's creator, Mike Mignola. Chris, thanks very much for joining us on air today. Sure, happy to be here. So uh, I've, I've... read over your life what an incredible career you've had just uh, from being uh, uh, such a sci-fi geek like myself uh, the the upbringing the stuff you've written and i love that it looks like you just quit your job out in 2003 to launch monkey brain books which i think that kind of leap of faith is fantastic and it's amazing can you talk a little bit about uh how you felt taking that leap um well it was it was a confluence of circumstances. I mean, in, in part, it was to do that. In part, it was because I hated my day job. <laughs> and in part, it was uh, we had a baby on the way. And I was, I, I was the parent that was going to be the stay-at-home parent with the, with the newborn. Um, so in actual fact, you know, I, I quit my day job, you know, kind of burning bridges behind me as I went. But then kind of only worked part-time writing and as an independent publisher for the next couple of years, you know, spending the other other half of my time changing diapers and feeding a baby and stuff like that. So <laughs> that, That's a yeah. full-time job, too, taking care of a child, as anyone will attest. Yeah. And that's with fun. 
the 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 emphasis on the sci-fi stuff you've written, uh, all the all the works you've done. Obviously, uh, you must have been influenced, as you said, growing up in the seventies and eighties by all the same stuff. I think I was obviously Star Wars, Star Trek, but even like the eighties Saturday morning cartoons. I was just talking with someone about Mighty Orbots, uh, all the oh, yeah. sci-fi stuff, fantastic things. So I think because you and I are similar in age, it was a fantastic time to grow up. We had access to all this stuff without all the internet spoiling it for us. I, I've often argued that uh, growing up in the 70s uh, and 80s was the perfect time to get an education in American pop culture because um, there were a, this started to be a proliferation of you know UHF channels and cable channels and stuff like that, but not enough content to put on them. So they just put on everything that ever had been. So, yeah, we were able to watch Saturday morning cartoons and stuff that was being made at the time aimed at us, but also cartoons from the 60s or old film serials from the 30s and 40s or old you know black and white science fiction movies. Just everything. It was all just uh, the, the 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 stew in which I was marinating my entire childhood. And all the cool novels and short stories you've gotten to work on uh, X Men: The Return. You actually did Star Trek: Mirrored Universes, um, Shark Boy and Lava Girl, which was a, a movie. Uh, you worked in collaboration with that on Robert Rodriguez. Uh, talk a little bit about working on these things that obviously, like me, you grew up. Uh, taking in but then to be able to work on them must have been a surreal experience uh yeah absolutely i mean by the time i was uh by the time i hit around 40 i had gotten to work in one capacity or another on everything i was most obsessed with <laughs> growing up with only a couple of exceptions um like i've never done anything star wars and that's kind of okay because i, I prefer to be a fan of, of some things you know i don't want to be too involved and see how the sausage is made. Sometimes I just like to enjoy the sausage. But yeah, I got to write Superman for like a year. I worked on a Star Trek project. Um, I thought for sure I was done. Like I had gone through my entire bucket list of everything I thought I might want to do. And that was around the point that um, the the opportunity to work on, on Hellboy and BPRD and, and the other uh, Mike Vanilla stuff with Mike came along a few years ago. And suddenly I realized that my, there was an item on my bucket list that I had not realized was there. And to be working alongside uh, Mike, who created this character, it's got to be, I would think, equal parts exciting, but a little bit daunting because you're working alongside the character's creator. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about working with Mike? It's hugely intimidating. I mean, he's a, he's a super nice guy. He's awesome. But it is very much like, you know, uh, he's, he's handing me the keys to his car while he slides into the passenger seat <laughs> and is just trusting me to drive it. And um, I've got to try really hard not to screw it up, you know, like not to not to crash the car, not to, you know, scratch the bumpers or, or do a bad job of parallel parking. Um, and it is it's super exciting. It's something I've been a fan of since it first appeared 25 plus years ago. And um, it's incredibly intimidating at the same time because I don't want to screw it up. And it would seem like looking at your other work you've done, your sci-fi and your alternate history stuff, this is almost like the perfect job for you, being able to work in, with such an incredible creator on such a well-loved character as Hellboy, but also to draw in all these elements. It's, it's set in the past, and, the, and you're drawing in all these elements of witchcraft and history and everything. So was this like looking at it now, do you, can you imagine going anywhere more where this will be uh, more, uh, I, guess, I guess I should say, a better fit with your talents? Um, it is pretty pretty tailor made for me. It, 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 the the demands of the job are all the things I enjoy doing anyway. So like I am a uh, I'm a history buff. I also like you know playing around in different genres and mixing uh, different things together. And b between Hellboy and the BPRD, which is a book set right now during the Cold War in the fifties, but also Witchfinder, which is a Victorian occult detective in nineteenth century London. And I've done stuff set in the, the jungles of 1920s Siam and all kinds of different things. So basically every new project is an opportunity to tell a story in the way that I most like doing and the kinds of stories that I most enjoy reading. Um, so really I've been training for this gig my entire life, both as a, <laughs> as a writer but also just as a, as a fan and a reader. 
And with Hellboy and the BPRD uh, set, it, it, they're like they're they're great stories to read. If you're reading these now from Dark Horse, you know what I'm talking about. They're they're bite sized It's like uh, almost a little anthology, and you can read part of it. Uh, you don't have, really have to keep up with an overarching story like so many comics seem to have nowadays. So it's a fantastic way. There's no bad place to dive in. Even if you didn't get the first couple of issues, you can dive in somewhere along the way, and it's it's fantastic and kind of gives you a sense of what it's about without overwhelming in a reader. Yeah, I mean, very much so. We we tend to approach every storyline as a self-contained thing, that you could just pick up the first chapter of each new storyline knowing nothing about these characters of the world and be able to, like, catch up pretty quick. And so every, every, new, every new, you know, first chapter is a new jumping on point. And then you've got this entire big world of, you know, I don't even know how many volumes it is now to explore. And uh, David Hyde was very kind enough. He sent me over some PDFs so I could look over because I hadn't kept current on several comic books series lately. But he sent me over. I was reading uh, the, the 1956, the, the Wandering Souls, uh, which you co-wrote with Mike, uh, Beyond the Fences. And it's just these stories, uh, for being short stories, they still just draw you in. You're like immersed and it's immediately, you kind of block out everything around you. I'm not sure if that's a combination of the art and the storytelling or if it's just it's set in such a different time period from what people are used to reading when they pick up a comic book. What do you think, uh, from feedback you've gotten from fans, seems to be the biggest allure? Uh, what is it that, that's so magical about these stories and this character? Well, I think really most readers respond first and foremost just to the characters themselves. So the characters and the world that Mike and his collaborators have built over the course of the last two and a half decades. Um, that's certainly what drew me in his career initially. Like, both Hellboy himself, but also the supporting cast o- over the course of decades are just really compelling characters. And the the world that they move through is very much like ours on the surface, but with, you know, these really interesting secret stuff going on behind the scenes and in the shadows and around the corners. And so, yeah, it's just a really, it's interesting to follow these characters as they explore that world. And we're talking with Chris Robertson right now, uh, currently co-writing Hellboy in the BPD, uh, B- BPRD, if I can get that out right. Uh, we're going to be taking our first commercial break. You're okay to stick with us for another segment, Chris? Sure. We'll come right back after this, talking more with Chris Robertson. Stand by. Hey guys, this is Raul Coley and I play Dr. Ravi Chakrabarty on the CW's iZombie and you're listening to geek to me Radio. And we are continuing our chat with Chris Robertson, working on currently Hellboy in the BPRD with Dark Horse, also co-creator of iZombie. And I mentioned to Chris off air that we've had Rahul Coley on the show a couple times in the past. He's fantastic. And this is a show that... It, it hooked me from the first episode. I immediately fell in love with this show. And having been one of the co-creators, Chris, uh, what were your thoughts on it being made into a series and the execution of the series so far? Uh, well, it, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the word surreal earlier, and that was definitely what that experience was. Um, you know, Mike Allred and I <clears throat> did the iZombie comic. And it wrapped up a couple of years before it was optioned for the TV thing. And, you know, I've, I've been at this long enough that I'm pretty cynical about um, movie and TV options because they tend not to come about. Like, they, there's a, often discussion about these things, and then they don't end up getting made. And I went so far as I was, I was on the set during the pilot uh, on Rahul's first day filming, actually. Um, and even then, I thought, well, these are very nice people, and this seems cool, but th- th- this isn't going to happen. And it wasn't until the show was actually on the air that I had to admit that, yeah, this, this looks like it's going to happen. Um, and I couldn't be luckier. The, the, the showrunners are fantastic. Uh, everybody in the cast and crew is great. And I have just really, really enjoyed both the experience and the show itself, which is one of my favorite shows on television. And it's just, we've said it before on this show, uh, it's probably, for my money, the smartestly written show on network TV currently. Just the the brand of humor, the style, the the uh, concept in general is just fantastic. And Rahul's actually going to be on again before the season five uh, premiere. We're going to talk to him again. He's been very great and gracious. Um, what 
have they how often do they reach out to you like once the show's option and you've you've done do they still reach out for you for input on anything at all throughout the uh, course of these now five seasons what i like to say is that i um why i've been informed but not involved like in the very early days they sent me uh the, the, the scripts for the first few episodes just to let me know what it was going to be like. And as I said, that we were on the set and then I saw rough cuts, but it's, by the time they were doing like the fourth or fifth episode, I, I, I was very comfortable and confident that, that they were, they knew what they were doing. And at that point I just started watching it in broadcast. Like I didn't want to know what was happening. I didn't want to <laughs> know what was coming. I wanted to be able to watch it along with the audience as, as it happened. Um, and I've been very comfortable remaining there in the audience. So, like, I tend to see the, the cast in Comic-Con and whatnot, <clears throat> and I've been on a couple of panels with them and things like that. But I'm, I'm more in my element in the audience than I am anywhere near a camera. And now with Hellboy being brought back on the big screen, um, it's got to be, again, this is a character you're working on and you're seeing it uh, brought to the movies. Uh, David Harbour now taking over from uh, Ron Perlman. What uh, what are your thoughts as far as uh, someone before it was announced that David would be doing it? Were you nervous about who they'd be casting? Was there any thoughts in your mind who should be cast? And what was your feelings once they announced it would be David Harbour playing the role? Um, it was something that Mike had mentioned to me fairly early on in those discussions. I mean, I, I am not, I'm just on the comic side. So right, I'm, again, right. I know pretty much beyond what's in the, the news, um, just occasionally things will come up in conversation during dinner with Mike or something like that. Uh, but I thought that, that David sounded like a perfect fit. Like, I mean, I just become a, a huge fan of his work through the, the, the two seasons of Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was willing to follow wherever they went. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie along with everybody else. I just saw the poster in the theater for the first time yesterday. Yeah, I think if all the things I've seen so far, I'm very excited about it. Uh, there's always that trepidation, I think, with anything, be it Doctor Who, when a new doctor takes over. Uh, there's always that trepidation of, oh, this isn't going to be the same. But I think once you really just let yourself go with it and enjoy the product, I think it ends up being a good change. I think these people at the higher levels know what they're doing, who are picking their their cast and uh you know as as an audience member i just kind of have to let it go and enjoy it and i nine times out of ten i'm pleasantly surprised by how things go yeah likewise so with writing hellboy uh it is set like you said in the cold war in the 50s it's got to be i guess writing a period piece as it were uh has to present a certain amount of challenges because it's not like we're used to writing something in a modern age we're used to working with all these stuff you have to go back and see what type of machine gun was being used at that time? What kind of car was being driven by you know, federal agents at that time? So what is the challenge in writing and staying faithful to such a period piece like Hellboy and the BPRD 1956? Well, it presents both opportunities and challenges. I mean, the opportunities it presents are, you know, here's an interesting moment in history, and maybe there's something we can explore in a story that wouldn't immediately jump to mind as being a thing that would, would have been happening at that moment in time. Or, you know, here's a little bit of historical trivia that, that is a hook we can hang a story on. But then, yeah, the challenges are, you know, making sure that as much as possible we're getting things historically accurate. I mean, this is a story about a giant red demon guy <laughs> who goes around fighting monsters. So it's not a documentary. But at the same time, you know, I, I want to keep the rest of it as close to real as I can get it. But fortunately, that's part of the job that I really enjoy. So spending days doing image research for, yeah, what kind of handguns would be used or what kind of clothes should people be wearing or what does this location look like or should it have looked like at the time um, is part of the fun for me. Uh, so I, I don't complain. And in fact, in fact, I often get so involved in that end of the process that I end up finding way more than the artist needs. <laughs> but then I let them decide what they're going to use. And with picking these locations for some of the stories that are taking place, is there a location or something that you're you're wanting to use or you've got an idea percolating in the back of your head that you just haven't gotten to that you're hoping to get to at some point? Um, yes. Yeah, there is. In fact, there's one I'm currently working on, and it, it would be set in the Pacific Northwest along the coast. And it, I'm currently working out the details of it, but it keeps moving around. At one point, it was kind of closer to Portland, and then it was closer to Seattle, and again, this is through the, the research, you know, finding what geographically are interesting features that would, like, isolate a place to make an interesting story. Um, and I learned interesting little tidbits that I didn't know along the way. 
And I will say we're we're set here. Uh, our radio station is based in St. Louis. We've got Alton, Illinois, right across the river, which is one of the most haunted places in the entire country uh, for paranormal activity. They've always done stuff. So just putting it out there, if you want to do a little research in Alton, Illinois, that might be a great place for a setting coming up. <laughs> I'll add that to the list. And when you're writing a character like this, like I said, alongside Mike Mignola, how much of it, uh, when you're co-writing a story, where does the the collaboration come into play? Is it do you bring him an idea? Does he bring him an idea, and you kind of marry them up, or is it uh, kind of like, well, I've got a rough idea, and then Mike fleshes it out, and vice versa? Where how does the collaboration work between the two of you? It depends. I mean, basically, all of those things have happened um, at one point or another on as we've gone through these series. Often they begin as a conversation that we have, um, you know. So then I might get a germ of an idea from Mike and then that, that, that he's had for a while, but it never kind of worked out how it would, it would, it would work or, you know, had an idea for a character or a thing, um, but wasn't sure what to do with it. And then I then go away and do research and try to figure out how to fit that thing together and make it work. And then it's not uncommon that I'll come back and Mike and our uh, Katie O'Brien, our editor help me pare down the stuff that's actually relevant to the story as opposed to the stuff that I just got a little too obsessed with in the research process. And with some of the artists you're working, obviously Mike's drawing of Hellboy is just, I mean, he, he's got such an unmistakable style for anything he draws. His covers for, he's done for DC and Marvel, uh, and likewise, obviously Hellboy. But obviously you're working with some other great artists, Ben Steinbeck, Michael Walsh, Paulo Rivera. When you bring a story and then they start ri- uh, drawing and putting it, bringing the story to life in a way with the pictures is, are you ever surprised by, wow, I didn't think it would look like that. And is there ever a back and forth between you and Mike and the artists about, can we change this a little bit? How much are you involved with the artist as far as bringing the story to its full fruition? Um, to varying degrees, depending on the, the storyline. Um, that's usually orchestrated by our editor, Katie O'Brien. Um, and I will occasionally have input uh, you know, I'll see a rough pass of the art, and I might on rare occasion um, suggest a tweak just to make sure that a story point's being hit or that, you know, a thing is historically the way that it, it, it needs to be. But nine times out of ten, they are doing far more than I could have imagined that they would do. My scripts to them are a description of what I think they're going to do, and they are far more t- talented and good at what they do than the imaginary version of them that lives in my head. So they invariably outstrip what I've expected. And if you are uh, listening right now, we're talking with Chris Robertson, uh, currently co-writing Hellboy in the BPRD from Dark Horse. You can follow him on Twitter at Chris underscore Robertson, I believe. There's an underscore in there. That's correct. And, of course, the website, chrisrobertson.com. What else can we uh, keep an eye out for you besides, obviously, I'm sure this is keeping you very busy working with uh, Hellboy. And uh, what else are you working on that we can keep an eye out for you? Um, The thing that's currently on the stands is a prequel to uh, God of War, the PS4 game, that uh, uh, Tony Parker and I are also doing with Dark Horse. I think issue three has just come out with a fourth issue yet to come. Fantastic. And we can keep up. Are you going to be uh, doing any cons that we, uh, I know we've got Planet Comic Con coming up in Kansas City. We always broadcast live from Wizard World here in St. Louis. Are there any other cons that are on your schedule right now? Um, In March, I'll be at Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle. And I think that's it right now for what's on the schedule. This is going to be a stay at home and work year. Gotcha. <laughs> I, I guess the cons would get kind of time consuming and take away some, uh, I guess, quality work time in that, in that sense. Yes. So we will keep up with you on your website and on Twitter. And if you're in the uh, Seattle area, Emerald City Comic Con is always a fantastic show. Chris Robertson, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Hopefully we we can have you back on sometime soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Take care. There he goes, Chris Robertson. Uh, If you want to go out and get those comics now, they're in your stores. Hellboy and the BPRD. And, of course, that God of War prequel he was just discussing. We are going to take our next break. We'll come back talking with Justin Burnett of Justin's Comics all about what's hot on the stands right now. Stand by. years I'm free. Time to conquer Earth. Alpha, we just escaped. The fruit of team of teenagers with attitudes. Hi, this is Michelle Nichols. And you're listening to 
Geek to Me Radio. We are back. Talking now with Justin Burnett of Justin's Comics, all about what's hot, what are the trends in comic books, and what you can look for on your shelves in the month of February. Justin, thanks for being on air. Thanks for having me on once again. Anytime. So I know uh, the January is now closed out. Uh, we're going into February. What were some of the top-selling books for last month, for January? What did you see flying off the shelves? Um, I mean, there's just so many, so much good stuff. Now, one of my personal favorites that was kind of um, a surprise, anyways, over the last couple, I guess it's been about a month or a month and a half, but Conan the, Barbar- the Barbarian came out. I've read issues one and two. Um, it's ruthless. It's savage. It's brutal. There's multiple decapitations <laughs> and um it's an enjoyable enjoyable um reading good writing um, jason aaron does it he also does thor and so i guess you know he has a thing for doing like medieval sorcery type um guys but it's a really good book um i know last year i, I strongly recommended immortal hulk and it's a book i or comic book that i still recommend yeah um and it ended up winning the diamond gem award for best new comic book series so made me look a little bit a little extra smart so <laughs> my recent recommendation now is conan yeah i know i was very surprised i never read conan uh from marvel when i was in the comic books before uh so when this new one pick uh, came out i picked up the first issue i'm like yeah let's give it a read i was very very impressed i think like you said jason aaron is probably the best pick uh for a writer having done all this work on uh thor previously uh, he kind of knows how to handle that genre, and I was very impressed and read it. Uh, just couldn't wait for the second issue to come out. So Conan the Barbarian from Marvel, very, very, uh, very strong choice. Yes, it is. And it's a little bit different than the stereotypical like Marvel books, and I think that's one of the things that it, it kind of does its own thing. So it's impressive in that way. Um, I think a lot of people, and I've, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from customers and stuff too, that it is a, a really, really good book. And um, and for us, the January, you know, it's incredibly cold January. We ended yeah. up having a really good month. We tripled sales from the year before. Oh so wow! Congratulations! It's a great time, as always, for comic books, and I'm I'm enjoying it. And once again, Justin Burnett uh, talking with the owner of Justin's Comics, 500 South 5th Street. If you're in the St. Charles, St. Louis area, head over to 5th Street and you can pop in there and see what they've got. Uh, I'm always, I always tell Justin on air and off air, I'm very impressed by the amount of variants he always has in stock. If you're looking for a hard to find variant and you can't find it anywhere else, chances are you can probably get it from Justin's Comics. And I know you've got a winter sale coming up this coming weekend, the February 9th and 10th. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so like I said, it's coming up, um, it's two-day sale, the February 9th and 10th on that Saturday and Sunday. Be 50% off everything in store, uh, 60% off on all back issues of any price that includes the, the big key books and the dollar books. The dollar books will be only 40 cents. Um, and we have a, you know, good variety of other back issues too, vintage comics and, and newer comics too. And we've got some games and toys and other, other stuff like that too. It's a great opportunity for us to clear some inventory and also give back to the community at the same time. Um, we'll be starting off Saturday with a little bit of food, probably bring in some donuts, have coffee throughout the day. So plan on it being a, a really fun time. You had me at donuts. That was right there. That's all I needed to hear. I'm there. And with uh, with some of the other key comics, like I said, I know I always talk about the variants you've got. Um, you always do such a good job on your social media, especially Instagram, of posting pictures of the new, uh, some of them very hard to find, some of them just particularly cool comic books. What are some of the key comics you currently have in store right now? Yeah, we, have, we have some big first appearances right now. we got the first appearance of Venom, the Amazing Spider-Man 300. The reduced price has it down to $196. Um, a Batman Adventures 12 for Charlie Quinn. That'll be down to 260. Um, first Thanos with Iron Man 55. We'd be down to 400. But the gym, the gym collection that we have right now, as we have the NYX um, one through seven graded, all CGC graded 9.8. So that's including the number three, the first appearance of X23. The reduced price will have it down to 1220 and a lot of times that one book will go for that, but we have the whole collection together. So 
So we have some really big keys in store right now, and the, this winter sale will be a good time to grab them up. Um, but like I said, we also have a lot of other great back issues, too, a lot of really good affordable stuff in store right now, and I really need to clear it out. So it's a great opportunity opportunity for people to go comic book shopping. And I know with all the uh, there's a lot of demand for these comics out there, and you see them all the time. People are are trying to find them, and some of the ones just the ones you mentioned alone. With uh, the sale, I don't know how this works. I, I don't think I've asked this question before, so this be educational for me as well. If someone can't make it to the store, I know you guys do online sales. Are the, is the fifty percent off of the winter sale just for people who come in the store, or if they buy it that day online, is there any way for them to uh, get them at the sale price, or is that strictly in store? They'll be strictly in store. Sometimes I'll do same day pulls, but usually, say if I have sixty percent off on a back issue, I would do maybe fifty percent off on the pull if they come and get it that day. Um, otherwise, it's first come first serve when it's deep discounted like that. Um, but I do work with stuff like um, like that. Now it's good that you mentioned the online store because we, I'm hoping by March or somewhere around that time to start an official online store as well, which the inventory will be kept separate from the in-store inventory. But that's one of our big plans um, for this year is to have an online store. Um, we're stocked up very well on comics. I have a, a stock room full of comics, so I can use those to start that online store. And if you're listening right now and you want to check out some of the stuff we've already talked about on Twitter, you can follow him, Justin's Comics, the numeral one. I believe it's the same handle on Instagram as well, yeah? Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I should know this, but I think, yeah, I think it's, um, <laughs> I'm looking it up now. <laughs> Justin's Comics on Instagram and um, Facebook, it's under Justin's Comics. You can also find us, Justin's Comics dot shop on, um, on, or for our website. Yeah, on Instagram, it's just Justin's Comics. Uh, on Twitter, Justin's Comics 1. And so the will the uh, with the website you've got, will the online store you're setting, will there be a separate website, or will there be just a little link they can click on from uh, the Justin's Comics dot shop? It'll be on our, our Justin's Comics dot shop website. It'll be its own, you know, it won't be like an eBay thing or anything like that. We'll, we'll have our own online store um, and kind of working out the kinks of it and stuff right now, and then I'm going to start, you know, categorizing and everything but of the inventory. So I'm hoping around March. Sometimes I'm, I'm a little bit behind on things, but it will be hopefully in the next month or two, I'll be able to get that rolling out and be one of those kind of things. Each week we'll add on more and more to the store and we'll have new comics and stuff like that available on there. Sounds good. Uh, always keeping us up with the hottest trends, Justin Burnett of Justin's Comics. Thanks very much for being on air with us today. We always appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Anytime. There he goes. Once again, justinscomics.shop is that website. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram, Justin's Comics one on Twitter, Justin's Comics on Instagram. We're going to come right back talking a little Alita Battle Angel right after this. Stand by. Hi, this is Shannon Farnan, the original voice of Wonder Woman, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back. It's a comic book theme today. We talked with Chris Robertson, the co-creator of iZombie, and also currently co-writing Hellboy and the BPRD 1956 alongside Hellboy's creator Mike Mignola. Talk to Justin's Comics about the hottest trends. If you haven't heard any of the show, maybe you just now found us, you've just now tuned in, you've not heard of this before, geek to me Radio, we're on every Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and you can go back and catch past shows after we're done airing them live. They are archived and put up as a podcast. They're on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, Podomatic. Best thing to do is to follow me on Twitter at geek to me radio i always put up the links to the shows maybe you don't like the podcast thing but you sometimes are at work and you just pull up youtube and you want to hear the shows uh we also put them up there on youtube so you can go to youtube find geek to me radio if you're trying to fit, keep track of all this i have a website geek to me radio.com there's little tabs at the top where you can find direct to my youtube page please subscribe uh when you're there uh, that's probably uh i need to do more work with youtube we're trying to do more work with youtube but our Numbers are a little anemic, so if you could go subscribe to me on YouTube, that'd be great. Uh, but we also are on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, Podomatic, and of course on Instagram at Geek to Me Radio. 
Uh, and then, of course, if you are on Facebook.com slash geek to me radio give the page a like there. I'm always very appreciative. Uh, I try to uh, I try to like pictures that my followers put up. I try to very, uh, very much be interactive on these social media. So please give me a follow on those channels. If it sounds like I'm desperate, I am. I'd love to have you follow me. That'd be great. And we always try to find fun stuff for you to talk about. If you're looking for something, maybe there's a concept you'd like, hey, you haven't talked about this before. Send me an email. Let me know what you'd like to hear. It's geek to me radio at gmail.com. In the subject line, all caps, put show suggestion. And keep it clean, folks. Uh, but we'd like to hear from you what you think. If there's a co- topic I haven't touched on, a guest you'd like me to try to get, I'm happy to do that. So please keep up with me on social media. Let me know what you'd like to hear. geek to me radio at gmail.com for those suggestions. We're going to take our last break. We're going to come right back. Maxim Movies and I are going to talk a little Alita Battle Angel. Stand by. Hi, this is Shin Han, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back. Wrapping up the show, talking about Alita Battle Angel. We can't say too much about it because it doesn't come out in theaters for another week and a half or so. Um, but Max and I both saw it recently at the gorgeous Ronnie's IMAX. Uh, before we get too much into the movie, I do want to mention our premier sponsor, the city of St. Charles, Discover stcharles.com is that website today is one of those weird days where it's absolutely gorgeous in the early of february we just five days ago couldn't go outdoors without freezing to death because we had sub-zero temperatures and today it's i think 62 degrees outside uh so if you want to make the most of the day you're a little stir crazy city of st charles is a great place to go you can go up and down the brick lined historic picturesque streets you can uh do a little warm out you can stop by riverside suites get an ice cream cone you can have a nice glass of wine out there uh all sorts of things to see and do for a foodie for history buff for one of those shoppers who likes to find unique things if you just want to go out and spend some time outdoors take a walk and if you're a pokemon go fan the pokemon stops out there are insane you're gonna level up you're going to get all the extra Pokeballs you need. You can find some Pokemon out there. And uh, it's always busy when the, when the weather's nice because people are walking up and down the streets on their cell phones playing Pokemon Go. It's just a fantastic place from all standpoints. We mentioned earlier we had Chris Robertson talking about uh, the, the haunting stuff that he looks into for his settings for these comic books. St. Charles would be an ideal setting as well. Uh, if you're uh, out there, take a look. If you're not in the area, you need to go there and take a look. There's lots of things to see and do. It's a beautiful place, and we're very, very lucky to have it. You can plan your trip all there on the website, discoverstcharles.com, the events, the things to do, food and drink, places to stay. That website has it all, discoverstcharles.com. So we were talking about Alita Battle Angel just coming out here in the next coming weeks. Uh, Max and I both saw it at a Marcus Theaters out there, Ronnie's. And I was very impressed. I w- was not familiar with the original manga. Um, I'm not sure if Max, if you were or not before seeing this, did you do any of the readings on the manga? Uh, you know, I've never actually read uh, the book series, which is called Battle Angel Alita. And some of the most uh, uh, frustrating moments about uh, this movie is I don't know why they, they changed that title around. It seems sort of uh, ridiculous to kind of change that around because Battle Angel Alita is a known property and, and those books are still being published. And uh, that the creator uh, has, has been lauded for his his work. So I think it's kind of strange that they that they uh, mix up the title. But I was aware of James Cameron wanting to make this film for almost a good 30 years. Yeah. And um, and I didn't realize until we saw the film and we saw this nice little special presentation afterwards, a QA, and a which I don't know if that'll be on the Blu-ray or not. Uh, because I hope it, so. It, well, I, I don't know. I mean, they do these at early early screening sometimes, and I haven't seen them pop up on too many special mm-hmm. features. Uh, there was one for Crimes of Grindelwald uh, at, as well. But anyway, um, I didn't realize how involved James Cameron still is in this. He co-wrote it. He produced it. He was very much uh, directing Robert Rodriguez, if you will, and Rodriguez was changing up his directorial style to be more epic like James Cameron. And I, I think what we have is, again, without spoiling anything, I think we have, to me anyway, as a, as a film critic, a film fan, the closest work of art 
to share a director's vision since Poltergeist. And what I mean by That's that impressive. is Toby Hooper was really trying to do Steven Spielberg. Yeah. So much so that people think Spielberg directed that film. And, uh, and that's a disservice to Toby Hooper, of course. And um, and with the, with this movie, it's so epic and it's so well done and it's so unlike what Robert has done. Yeah. I think you're, you're going to have people going, I think Jim Cameron directed this. You can definitely see elements of Rodriguez uh, in his directing style and everything. I felt like it was this, just this beautiful marriage of James Cameron's uh, vision for this executed by Rodriguez. I think it was uh, gorgeous. The film just blew me away. And uh, again, we saw it in IMAX, and that's got to be the way to see this movie. I think it's one of those, a lot of people said the same thing about Avatar. If you're going to see Avatar, you need to go see it in theater. This is built for that. I think uh, Alita Battle Angel, I almost said Battle Angel. Alita, sure. uh, Alita Battle Angel is much that same way. This is a must-see in theaters. You know, yeah, if you watch the trailers and uh, you are halfway interested in this, you have to go see it on the big screen. I would, re- of course, recommend Marcus Theaters. Uh, but but unlike a lot of other movies that have 3D releases or uh, IMAX releases that are just, you know, maybe a money grab, hey, we can charge a, yeah. a, a bit more. Early on, watching Alita Battle Angel, I realized this movie is served well by the experience, but by the overwhelming experience of IMAX and by the, uh, the, the, the tangible quality of good 3d conversion this is one of the best 3d conversions i've ever seen probably since avatar it looks it looks incredible and i think that because the movie is so high concept and so futuristic i can't imagine watching this in five years on my tv i don't want to i want to see it in a theater projected in 3d because it really is such a huge part of the experience and of course we can't really review the film but i think both you and i were coming from the same place where maybe our expectations weren't very high and i think that the movie exceeded both of our expectations i i really loved this this movie yeah and i always talk about uh i'm not sure how much this is for other film critics that they feel the same way but one of the things i always look at when i grade a movie review a movie is rewatchability if it's a film that i it was a good movie but I don't really need to see it again. That kind of lowers the the score for me a little bit. This is one of those movies I could I'll go to the theater tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday and see it again and again. I think it's a great film for the rewatchability because there's always something you didn't notice the first time. And plus, the story is just so great. It's it's dynamic. It's action packed. Uh, and it's got a lot of heart. You know, the first 20 minutes is standard science fiction world building. And I think for, for people who watch a lot of geek type stuff, they're going to be like, okay, I've seen this before. But after about, you know, the first 20 minutes of establishing the world, it gets weird in all the great ways. And I, I completely agree. This is a really cool world that I would like to return to. I think it's going to do pretty well at the box office if people see it in a 3D format or an IMAX format. And I think it's going to be one of those, if people are the same way I am, where they're not going to see a lot of drop off at the box office the second week. And I think this will hold steady uh, for the most part. We won't see that huge BVS Mm -hmm. uh, where there's that major just fall off of people who are like, meh. So I think if word of mouth is good, uh, which I think it will be. Yeah, me too. And people want to see it again. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for Max M Movies for talking movies with me. Thank you for Chris Robertson being on air. And thank you for Justin's Comics for talking about comic books with us. We're going to have a great show next week talking with the people, the composers behind the new Young Justice Outsiders. So until then, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound. Good night.